Hello everyone, this is Ben, and I'm not real sure what to call this video, this audio, however you want to think of it. Uh, what is the topic? It's basically something that I gleaned, you know, from, I guess, reading the New Testament. Um... I guess the topic is, is God keeping secrets, is a way to think of it. Uh, that's sort of what we're talking about here. Is God keeping secrets? And so, but there's more to it than that. And I don't know really how to explain it without just going into the situation of the apostles. So, let's think about this. The Roman government had recently, as, as, as far as I know, as far as I understand, the Roman government was oppressive, especially of the Jews, but they were oppressive of a lot of people. Um, they tended to conquer by force. People didn't always like it, but too bad they conquered. Now, I'm pulling information from different sources and piecing it together to give you sort of the details. Because most of the time what you hear at church is just like, the Roman government was oppressive and uh, the Jews wanted to be released. But it's like, that that's kind of doesn't carry much weight because you don't really know the story. Um, so it's just kind of shabby without the story. You know, it's it's vague. It's not It's not meaningful because you don't, get the force of it so it's like this the Jews had been a sovereign nation and then they the book of Kings tells us about how they they fell into sin and they were conquered by the Babylonians the Babylonians conquered them, and things weren't good under Babylon and under Babylonian rule. And uh, the valuables under the treasury were plundered, and they were carried off. They were forcibly removed from their land and carried off into exile in Babylon. Then the Persians came to... A sort of a meteoric rise to power. I think it was under under a Persian emperor named Cyrus. And so Babylon is in modern day Iraq, and then Persia is in modern day Iran. So the Persians came to power and they built a giant empire and they took over Babylon. And when they took over, they made things better for the Jews and they let the Jews come home, rebuild their temple. Um, I don't fully understand all of it, but like, if you go back to the, as best I understand it, if you go back to before about 1300 BC, you've got four major empires in the world, and all of the governments, all of the empires had been very, very oppressive. And then you have some sort of disastrous fall apart that's rather mysterious, and I won't speculate on it, around 1300 B.C. And I think King David lived... Let's, let's see. Uh, so the, the empires that were existing were like the ancient Greek empire, not the one that we, we hear about, but the ancient Greeks, the Hittites, which we long time thought were mythical, and that the Greeks and the, and the, the Old Testament were just making it up. And then you've got, I think, uh, Babylon and Egypt. And the only ones that survived that whatever this catastrophe was were, were uh, the, uh, the Egyptians. And so they tell us about what happened. Okay. And then we have now found Hittite records and archaeological and historical evidence, in other words, written records of the Hittites. 
And so that empire is now known to exist. Now, the, it says the Babylonian captivity. Okay, so it says they were captives in Babylon. So they were, all right, yeah, so they were uh, 605 B.C. All right, this is what Wikipedia is saying. So from about the time of the Bronze Dark Age, about 1300 B.C., these empires that were apparently very oppressive fell apart. And the only one that didn't fall apart was the Egyptians. And then you have this new, later, I think called, it's called the Neo-Babylonian Empire, it comes into existence, takes over the region of Mesopotamia, and the whole Jewish nation begins to exist around the time of this Dark Age. And then, by the time we get to 605 BC, which would be 700 years later, the Babylonians are carrying the the Jews off to captivity in Babylon. So captivity means like you're held against your will. You're captive. You're not a free person. You're you're in you're imprisoned basically. So the Persians were well looked upon by the by the Hebrews because the Persians conquered Babylon and they had a more lenient policy. I think as long as you gave lots of money to the to the Babylonian to the Persian Empire they let you have your land and sort of do your thing in your land as long as you paid homage to the Persians. And I think uh, the Persians, the all of the nations of the world that brought them money and tribute, it was they, they had a lot of money. But it was like as long as you keep the money flowing, you can kind of do your thing where you are. I think that's how it worked. I could be wrong. But the Persians were, of course, famously conquered by Alexander the Great. So, Alexander comes along and conquers Persia, and he has a sort of meteoric rise to power. He dies quickly, and his empire is divided among his four generals, because I think he left no heir. He left no child. Okay, and of course, with his father, it was like a big question of who's going to rule, and it's debated to this day how exactly Alexander came to power. But, um... The two eastern portions of Alexander's empire quickly fell and became Persia again. Whereas the two western portions became the Seleucid, I think it's the Seleucids, which would be like the upper Greek part, you know, like the, the Greek proper and, you know, what we think of as Turkey, um, Lebanon, Syria, Places like that, sort of the on the, on the west side is the northern part, and then the southern part is the Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt, and you know the southern areas. And so this is the Hellenistic world, where, whereas Hellenistic means uh, Greek. So the these empires essentially believe that it was better for you to be Greek, and you ought to be Greek, and you ought to do Greek things, and and so like we see a lot of the best Greek art actually in what we think of as Turkey and what we think of as North Africa across North Africa so this is why there's so much Greek influence in this whole Eastern world it's sort of the Greek world Alexandria is built as you know a center of learning and education and so there these people are all about shoving Greek ways on you and the Persians, I mean, uh, the, well, the Persians were a thorn in their side because they're a powerful empire that still had beef with the Greeks. The Greeks were, of course, conquered by the Romans, but the Romans were essentially very similar to Greeks in terms of their culture. And they, and they, they idolized Greek culture. And so there's a lot of conflict between Jews and Greeks in terms of their culture and their beliefs and so when you when out when the when the Hellenistic world becomes a thing you start seeing interaction between the Greeks and the Jews and a debate begins about you know 
theology and God and, and what's right and what's wrong. And you, you actually start having a lot of Jewish people living in Greek-speaking areas to the point that they actually, from what I've seen, they had to have a Greek, uh, an Old Testament in Greek called the Septuagint, which is out of Alexandria. And it's, let's see, when was the Septuagint? So the Septuagint is the Old Testament translated into Greek. And so... It says that the law, the, old, the, the laws of Moses were translated mid-3rd century B.C. So that would be like the 200s, like 250. And then the remaining texts were translated in like, like one... Well, no, that would be yeah, like 150. Okay. So, there you go. You ha you, by the time you get to the days of Jesus, you've got more Jews living in the diaspora outside of Israel than you have within Israel. I think I read in Rodney Stark's book, you've got about one million Jews living in what we would you know, call today Israel, but what the Romans called the, the province of Judea. And then another six million actually living outside. They were taking Greek names, speaking Greek. And so the Roman Empire conquers the, the Hellenistic world. They conquer the Greek world. And that still becomes, stays the Greek side of the Roman Empire. The Persians, and this is something, you know, the dates of this, I'm not super sure about and exactly all this, but like as I understand it from what I've heard, the Persians had rule, had recently taken over Israel and it was back in Persian hands and the Israelis, the Jews, liked this. The Persians were their friends. They were the good guys politically. And so the Jews are like this middleman, or what's called a buffer state. And they were like, on the one side, Persians they like. On the other side, the Greeks and then the Romans that they don't like. And there was a lot of, I mean, I haven't really ever learned the stories, but there was a lot of strife between the Israelis and and the the Hellenistic world. That's what the Maccabean Revolt is all about. Let's look that up. So Because it's, I never really... I never really, a Jewish rebellion lasting from 167 to 160 BC, led by the Maccabees against the Seleucid Empire and the Hellenistic influence on Jew, Jewish life. Okay, so, a revolt that happened. Alright, Antiochus the fourth was the, the ruler. Okay, the revolt was sparked because the Jews refused to worship the Greek gods. Alright. It was a guerrilla a guerrilla war. Alright. It was a successful revolt. Alright. Because it says the Seleucid Empire, em, Empire was weakened by political infighting and other wars against uh, Ptolemaic Egypt. Jewish festival of Hanukkah celebrates the, this uh, successful victory. Okay. Alright, now let's look that up. Babylonian... of Israel and brings up Babylonian captivity oh because I need to look up Persian rule of Israel Persian okay so 
says from 538 to 322 BC and basically until Alexander conquered Persia. All right. They were ruled by the Persians. So in 332, the Greeks under Alexander the Great okay, uh, uh, conquered Israel and they conquered everything. In 165 BC, after the religion-driven uh, Maccabean Revolt, the independent Orthodox Hasmonean Kingdom was established. In 64 BC, the Romans conquered Israel, turning it into a Roman province. Although coming under the sway of various empires and home to a variety of ethnicities, the area of ancient Israel was predominantly Jewish until the Jewish-Roman Wars of 66 to 136 BC, during which the Romans expelled most of the Jews from the area and replaced it with a Roman province of Palestina, beginning with the Jewish diaspora. At this time, after this time, Jews became a minority in most regions, except Galilee, and the area became increasingly Christian after the third century. Though the percentage of Christians and Jews are unknown. All right. Jewish settlements declined from 160 to 50 by the time of the Muslim conquest. They were about 10 to 50 percent of Palestine's population by the time of the Persian invasion of 614. That's that will be a Muslim, Muslim law. All right. So, according to this, there's no other rule of of per yeah, so Persia, I, don't, I, I guess what I heard on the radio contradicts what I read on uh, Wikipedia. Nonetheless, the Persians and the Jews had a better relationship than they did with the with the Romans. That's my point. And so we get down to this. What I've seen other places is that in the Roman Empire in in Italy. 90, in the Italian peninsula, 90% of the population were poor. And so it was about 30 to 40% slaves. And the slavery was what was really driving the poverty because the rich and powerful would created huge slave plantations called latifundia. And poor people, before the existence of the Roman Empire, the poor people had been able to be sort of middle class and make some money and have some stability and farm their land. But then along come the rich and powerful Roman elite with their armies and they just take land from poor people because they want it. And then the poor people are free. They're not slaves. They're Romans, but they can't like provide for themselves because they don't have enough land to farm and they're so poor that they can't eat. And so another 30% of the population now is the, the so poor that they can't eat. And so they are fed from these huge slave plantations. So the Romans created this thing called the bread and circuses where they would have uh, fights in the Colosseum and stuff like that for poor people that they had taken the land from because they didn't want mass mass death and then they would give them like really uh, terrible handouts of food and people lived off that but they didn't live well and so uh, what you get is uh, poor people who have been taken off their land and then their land is now populated with these huge slave plantations the slaves come from outside the empire and the slaves don't live very long because the situation is so harsh for them but there's always more slaves because the Roman army just gets more slaves from the neighboring lands the Roman army stays at war with the Persians I think their entire history and so Israel is like on the border with Persia it's like a a buffer state and so and Israel had had a better relationship with the Persians who you know had freed them from captivity whereas the Romans were very oppressive we know from you know the way things worked in the they tell us about tell us about in the in the Old Testament or in, in, the, in the New Testament like 
the tax collect the way the Romans collected taxes from the Jews was they would see the issue with the with the high Roman taxes and any time you have a government like the Roman government which is called a command economy which is which means that trade and long distance trade and all of that and commerce boils down to I'm powerful I have an army you give you give you supply me with what I want because I say so and so that's the way things worked in pretty much all of these empires they had command economies so like uh I think what I what I heard in Ronnie Stark's book is like pretty much everywhere until you get to medieval Europe that's all there is so like um except with the exception of the 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 earlier Greek world before they really had a Greek empire it was more there was more freedom and there was more independence because it was a local city although they were trying to conquer and take over other people there there was a disunity that was just natural to the way things worked so anyway the Romans had these huge slave plantations and they feed people from these huge slave plantations and this is how they operate like they just like Slaves are dying like crazy, and then these poor people that they're giving this terrible food, malnutrition would have been part of their regular existence. So then there's so that's sixty percent of the population of Italy. Then you've got another fifteen percent of people who are able to farm their own land and feed themselves, but they are on the brink of malnutrition and starvation. But they're they're stable. And then you've got another 15%. Well, no, then you they're not stable. They're on the they're on the brink of starvation and malnutrition, that kind of thing. Then you've got the final 15% that's like actually stable, that actually has you know, able, able to provide for itself with with security and stability. So like that's 90%. So that means the other 10% is the ruling elite and they're they're just running things. And so the Romans would just take what they wanted because they said so and so the Jews were no exception and so in a command economy it's like the government's going to take what they want because they say so and what happens is everyone if the government's going to work that way if they're just going to say if they're if they're just going to leave you with just enough food and money or whatever for you to live on and then take whatever surplus you have then they're operating under a greedy sort of principle and that's how things work but what happens is this also makes the poor people greedy because the poor people now will not they're not going to go on a vacation and like you know enjoy the fruits of their labor you know because then or not they're not going to put a new roof on their house they're not going to get another ox so they can plow their fields more and have more harvest next year because what you don't want is for the government to know that you made some more money. So you're trying to make more money without the government knowing. And so it becomes more about hiding the money you have than it is about uh, reinvesting the money that you have to have more. So the Roman government is certainly no exception. It's definitely a command economy. And so this is how things work in the Roman government. So if you understand that, you understand like the Jewish... The, the taxation system, what the Romans would do is they would take an actual member of Jewish society and they'd say, all right, well, this is what we're going to do. You are a member of this you know, local Jewish community. You know everybody here. You're a member of the community. So, like, you know who's got a lot of money and who isn't, who doesn't. Because under a command economy, it's all about hiding your wealth. So people are hiding their money so they don't have to pay their taxes. Because the taxes are ridiculous. Like they, they enslave you. So like you need somebody who knows who's got what money. You can't just have Roman Romans coming in from out of town and taxing people because everyone's gonna lie and pretend that like they don't have any money when really they're hiding it all. So you have Jewish tax collectors, but they're given a squad of Roman soldiers. And it's quite simple. Their job is to collect these ridiculous Roman taxes. Now, the way the Romans would entice Jews like this to betray their countrymen was by saying, 
you can take as much as you want to. You can use the soldiers to take as much as you want to. So the tax collectors become very rich. They become the most hated guy in town. And it's also because every little interaction with the tax collector will you will find out quite fast like you, you don't want him to know what you've got because everybody's trying to hide their money so you don't you don't invite him over to your house you don't have anything to do with that guy okay so that gives us you know some of the we talk about the Roman army and the Roman Empire is oppressing the Jews and the Jews are God's people okay so that gives us some of the, the issue of what I'm talking about in this video about God being secretive with the apostles. But there's more to it than that because the Rome. Now, before I go into the more to it, let me add one more thing. From what I've seen, in the rest of the empire, rural life, country farm living was more stable. And so poverty was at about 60%. So instead of it being 90%, it's about 60%. So you have your portion of slaves. So you can. You can say like a third slaves, like 20, so it's like 20% slaves, 20% bread and circuses, and then 10 and 10 maybe of the, the last third would be, you know, the better off but still poor. And then you've got 40% uh, who are actually in the, you know, so you've got a much, you've got a middle class that's realistic, you know, things are better off. So, but anyway, there's also... There's also conflict between the Jews when it comes to Roman culture and Roman beliefs. The so, for example, uh, the Romans worship gods that the Jews would have found abhorrent and evil. So, like, and then if you if you understand that like these are the gods the Romans worshipped, then you begin to understand like okay they're going to, you know, have a different way of life because this is what they worship. So I'll give you one example of one story. This story starts out with a guy named Zeus, who's a god. He's like the chief god. He's taken over from his dad uh, with the help of his grandparents. Yeah. But anyway, um, Zeus takes over. He's the, he's the god, and he's looking down at the city of Troy and he sees a long, as they say, golden-haired Trojan boy named Ganymede. And so Zeus just like really, really has the hots for Ganymede. Like gay, Ganymede is a boy, and Zeus is a man or a god man. So like, so like, uh, this is very homo. This is homosexual. Okay. Now Zeus is uh, unique among the the gods of Olympus because he's married to Hera. He's like the married god. Um, but as I've seen, you know, I've, what I've seen other places, and I guess I need to, like, double check some of these things, but, like, I think it was a, like, a hist history documentary. Zeus was the god of cheating on your wife, because it was understood that, like, you need to cheat on your wife every once in a while. Okay, um, so they, it's not like they think cheating on your wife's wrong sexually, it's like they have a god of cheating on your wife. So Zeus turns into a big eagle and like it's so gigantic that like the clouds move as he comes through them and he just snatches up Ganymede just plucks him out of the city because he's got the hots for him takes him back to Olympus he transforms back into the god Zeus and they have sex so Zeus makes Ganymede the uh, cup bearer the wine bearer which means that his job is to keep uh, when the gods uh, drink the ambrosia which is their god juice, then, like, it, he uh, fills the cups. And so he fills all the cups, but when he fills Zeus's cup, he uh, smooches the, the uh, he gets, puts a kiss on it. And so Hera is uh, really mad about this and does not uh, like the fact that Zeus is doing this. And Zeus said, you know, he likes it. And so Hera's mad. All of the other gods and goddesses are jealous of Zeus because he's found this hot young boy. And they think he, and they just like him. Okay, so Hera is mad and she's going to kill Ganymede. So Zeus turns Ganymede into a god so that he's immortal. 
And so Hera says, all right, if I can't get back to Ganymede, so the way gods get back at each other is like, instead of attacking each other, they attack uh, someone that you like or, you know, something like that. So like Apollo had a gay affair with Hyacinth and the Zephyr was the, the, the wind god. Zephyr was like a mad, so he, uh, he kills Hyacinth. Um, and then the flower comes up. Or is it Narcissus? No, it's, hy it's Hyacinth. And so the Hyacinth uh, flower comes up uh, to remind it's to remind us all of the lost gay love between Apollo and Hyacinth. Okay. So, like, uh, it's holy, you know. Um, the So, Hera decides to plant seeds that will lead to war that will destroy destroy Troy. And so she comes up with a way she she goes to the other female goddesses, uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, sex and romance and all that, and Athena, the goddess of wisdom and all, both of these goddesses have like such a backstory. So like how, wh where is Aphrodite? How was Aphrodite born? All right, she's older than Zeus. She, she's like a earlier generation. <laughs> and she... I'll I give you the graphic details. So, the Sky Father Uranus and the Earth Mother Gia, or Gi, uh, have sex and create the next generation, which is the Titans. And the Titans don't they want to take over and stuff, and so, like, they don't want uh, Uranus having any more children. So, Kronos, the leader of the Titans, gets a special, super, like, magically sharp sickle, which is like a sort of a hooked knife for reaping, you know, grain and cutting grass and, and, and stuff, and, and uh, cuts uh, the scrotum of the Sky Father, Uranus. And so his uh, semen falls down to the sea. And I think there is a connection that the Greeks say that's what the sea foam is. But out of this, it's either an egg or it's just her, but out of this comes Aphrodite. And so Aphrodite is like everything sexual, lust, love, marriage, romance, uh, you name it. Aphrodite. Um, so, I mean, you could say, like, yeah, we probably still worship Aphrodite today. We just don't say it, you know. Just like, you know, uh, another example would be Athena was the goddess of wisdom and peace and, like, uh, defensive warfare. And uh, she had a con... You know, these, these gods and goddesses have consorts, which are, like, their, their buddies that, like, work with them and work for them. And so she's always depicted with uh, another goddess in her hand, I think, who has wings, and this goddess is the goddess of winning, and so if you win in sports or in war, she comes and puts the winner's champion's crown on you, which is the laurel wreath, which is like, today we would have trophies, but back then they they understood that your, your championship, I think, was always temporary, so instead of having a permanent trophy, you know, next year comes around, you're not the Olympic champion anymore, you're, it's, we're going to have a red race again, but this goddess, the goddess of winning, or victory was literally her name was Nike or uh, Nike, Nike I think is a yeah but like Nike the god of winning so we I mean we still worship Nike today we, we still worship a lot of these these gods and goddesses you know if we understand like what they represented it's like oh yeah people still worship that you know um, there's a reason people still call a good looking man an Adonis. And that sort of thing. So, the, uh, so you get Aphrodite and you get Athena, and so you can understand, that, like, these are some powerful egos, and so Hera has the idea to say, she start, she gets them started arguing who's the prettiest. And so they can't resolve it, so they, Hera's like, this is what we'll do. We'll have, uh, this young, uh, prince of Troy. His name's Paris. I think Paris is his name. We'll have him, uh, you know, judge the beauty contest for for us. You know, since we can't be objective or whatever. And so, 
Hera knows that like Paris will be, you know, Aphrodite will say, oh, if you pick me, I'll give you the hottest chick in the world, which is, of course, Helen of Sparta. And then she becomes Helen of Troy, right? So they're all trying to bribe Paris, you know, but uh, Aphrodite's bribe is the best. And so then you have, uh, how's it go? The bribe works. Aphrodite wins the beauty contest. And, but then the Greeks are really mad because, like, she, Helen is the wife of the king of Sparta. And so the king of Sparta goes to the big empire, which, uh, the big, uh, city, which would be, uh, Mycenae. And the Mycenaeans, like, basically, uh, already wanted to conquer what we now know as the Hittite Empire. But, they already wanted to conquer Troy, which would have been a major port city for the Hittite Empire. And we now have Hittite records that, like, this battle actually happened. Um, or, but it, it didn't necessarily have uh, these these uh, mythical aspects of, like... So eventually, like, uh, the gods sort of choose sides. So, like, Zeus is... I forget which side, which side is... Okay, so Zeus is supporting the Trojans, but Athena lost the beauty contest, and that's his daughter, who's been prophesied to one day conquer Zeus and take over Olympus. So she fights with the Greeks. So there's that beef, but then Hera's on with them, you know, because like she wants the Trojans destroyed. And then, uh, how's it go? Uh, they all, you know, Aphrodite's with Zeus, and blah, blah. So like, um, they all give like all kinds of like uh, assistance to the different sides, and the big war goes down, and then eventually I think uh, the gods are actually on the battlefield battling each other with their superpowers. But like they're still it's still a stalemate, and then this random guy, the king, this guy named Odysseus, who's the king of like a tiny little nation, comes up with like an intellectual trick to like win, and he like comes up with the Trojan horse tactic, which honestly, when you think of the Trojan horse, t to give a brand of condoms the name Trojan seems like an amazingly bad idea. But like, so he has the idea, we're all pretend we're going to leave, right? We're going to go just far away enough, right? It's all, they got it all planned out, all timed out, you know, and like all the Greeks are like, we're sorry, and they leave, they build this fancy horse as a gift, as a going away present, and they're sorry they tried to conquer Troy. There's like a group of commando guys hidden inside. And so they just stay in there and they let the Trojans get all wasted. And uh, and they drink and, and, and they, they're in the debauchery and the revelry. And they sneak out in the night and like open the doors. And, and the Greeks have all come back and they come in and Troy is destroyed. And uh, another city was later built at the place and it's called Troas. And for a long time everyone said, you know, that's the that's traditionally... That was supposed to be where Troy was, but modern historians were like, is that really where it was? But then they finally did find, you know, ancient Troy. So, the thing is, uh, Odysseus then becomes uh, real arrogant and says that he's more awesome than uh, the gods and uh, talks smack to him and says that y'all couldn't end this war, but I did with my little, my little trick. And so then he has to go on this long... Uh, epic uh voyage back home that like sucks really bad for him and the whole point is for him to like uh admit that the gods are more awesome than him and that he's you know and that sort of thing so uh and then he's finally allowed to go back home and uh Athena does help him but he has to overcome he's he's opposed the whole time by uh Poseidon the king of the sea you know Roman Neptune so these are, that's the, the short rundown of two major Greek stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And you've got to understand that for like, for Greeks, as far as their religion goes, the Iliad and the Odyssey are kind of like the Bible, in a way. Like, the Greek written alphabet was created just to write those stories down, because they were so important. And like, every Greek child, you know, th this is like, the book you read in school to learn to read Greek, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So, like, 
this helps us get a get kind of a grip for like the difference in cultural beliefs between the Greeks and the Romans, like I mean versus the Jews. The Jews had this monotheistic God who was perfect and holy in every way, never did anything wrong. I mean, let's let's just list out. So the Jewish Bible, let's just go with sexual stuff. The Jewish Bible said that it's a sin to have sex um, outside of marriage, period. It was very, very clear. You can go to, I think, uh, Leviticus 18. Um, it, it couldn't be more clear. The, the Greeks, uh, for example, one of their uh, most important philosophers by the name Plato, he said this, and I have read this, Plato said that if you are a man who desires sex with women more more than men, then you are an unfaithful man. You're the kind of man that can't be trusted. You know, you're an adulterer. I think he says you're an adulterer, which is kind of weird. It's like, what? So anyway, you get the point, like, Homosexuality in ancient Greece was considered uh, the best. Um, and then it says that women who desire sex with other women are also the same. They're also adulterers. So the, the moral of the story is that it's bad. A person who has sexual desire for women is a bad person. Okay, and I mean, that goes back to like, the Greek concept of, of women and that sort of thing. So, like, Zeus creates humans, and then he's not happy with them, so he kills them all, and then he creates another race. So it starts off with the gold race. They're not right. He makes them out of gold. Then he makes them out of silver. And then it's, like, a little better, but still not right. So then he makes the, like, the dirt race of men, like, made from dirt. And, like, uh, that's the, they work out all right. But then Prometheus is this other god, and he wants, like, he wants them to, uh, humans to advance and become uh, learn things and become more powerful and more advanced and Zeus didn't want them to do that because then one day they'll uh, they'll rival him you know the same way that he rivaled his father um, so Prometheus gives the humans the fire which is the first uh, technology and so Zeus is really mad about this and so he punishes Prometheus by putting him down in the underworld and since Prometheus is a god, he's immortal, so he can't die. So, like, basically what happens is uh, if he's injured, he just regenerates. And so Zeus chains him with, like, super magic chains to a big rock and has eagles that come regularly to feast on his flesh. And so he has to, for forever, endure this torment. Um, and he just regenerates, and then they feast on his flesh again. So Prometheus. And then to mess things up with the humans, Zeus says, okay, I've got, I've got to introduce something. You know, now that fire has been introduced and it's the first human technology, you can't put the cat back in the bag. So instead, he lets way more cats out of the bag. So he creates the first woman, and her name is Pandora. And she is called, Zeus calls her the beautiful evil. Uh, beautiful cacon, which means evil. So, like, um... Pandora's there, and, like, she's, her point is one of the, she's got multiple purposes. She, first of all, she's given access to a jar that contains, like, all of the terrible things in the world, like disease and poverty and war, you know, and, like, everything sucky. And uh, it just says something on there, don't open it, or, like, all kinds of terrible stuff will happen. And then, of course, Pandora's a woman, and so she's, like, very curious and also very stupid and so therefore she opens it and so this gives you an idea in Greece this is the origin of women Pandora's Eve she's like Eve from Adam and Eve except in the new in the Old Testament Eve was created to make the world a better place it's he's, you know God looks down and says it's not good that Adam should be alone and I will make a helper suitable for him someone it's like a, a, a proper companion. And so that's why women were created. That's why Eve was created. Whereas uh, Zeus creates Pandora because he wants, she's created just like the, 
the Greek view, I think this comes from Aristotle, the view of women was that they were men, basically, that were born with birth defect. And they, they said that, like, that's what they thought the female period was. That's a birth defect. And if she was born correctly, she would have born a man, and she would have had uh, semen the way a man does. But because she has the female period with the regular monthly flow of eggs that and all the blood, that means that, like, she's a defective man. So... And also mentally defective. So again, Pandora opened the jar and all of the evils came out. You know, poverty, uh, disease, famine, plague, war, you know, all this stuff. And so she's like, oh no, what have I done? And so she tries to close the jar to keep, keep them in. And she manages to keep only one of the evils in the jar, which is hope. And so we normally think of hope as a good thing, but the Greeks really like the idea of like, but it also can be a bad thing. And now that Pandora's opened this jar, you'd be a fool to hope. So hope would just make your life worse. Um, but that's not all. Women were also created to make men dumber. So the, the beauty of women was created to take a man's ability to be intellectual and smart and lofty and remove his ability to use his intellect and make him more uh, of a savage uh, animal and take away his intellectual ability. And so that had to be kept in check. So, like, the way it worked is like this. Men, I think I, what I read is, like, one Roman said that, like, men were supposed to have sex with, like, sex slaves on, like, five times a day. And I'm guessing that if you didn't have sex slaves, if you were too poor, then you went to prostitutes, because uh, we know that prostitution was just very normal, and in some cases, actually a sacred uh, ritual of devotion to the gods. So, there's that, you know, you, you get like, and so, I think Plato wrote that the highest form of love was between two men, because that's love between equals, and it can be, it's not based on sensuality and sensual desires, it's based on mental, you know, you actually love that person for their mind, because you can't love a woman with, with your mind. So, we can see some conflict there, although it's important for us to understand that the, the, uh, the Jews in this day, they didn't have a good view of women either. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of their culture too. But there were still other areas of conflict. I mean, they didn't agree with this Pandora story. And they were not going to worship gods like Zeus and, you know, whatever. Uranus and Athena and all that. So like, or Apollo or any of them. Um, Athena... Sometimes people get the wrong idea about Greeks and they think that, like, Athena was going to fix all of the problems with women. And they fail to understand that, like, in the Greek mindset, being female is not a bad thing. It's being a human female that's a bad thing. It's nothing wrong with being female. It's just the problem. It's just human females. So, uh, the, you know, the gods and goddesses, the goddesses are not, you know, they're worshipped. But that doesn't mean that human females are anything to be worshipped. Uh, um, so th there's that, you know. Athena was born because uh, it was said that if if the Earth Mother, Gia, and, uh, and Zeus ever had a child, this one would take over. And Zeus uh, did everything he could to avoid it, but I think he had some sort of contact with Gia. And, like, eventually... Uh, he started having a headache, and, like, Athena popped out of his head. She, like, popped out fully with her full armor on, which symbolized that she was of a, she was more civilized, that she was born with her clothes on, so she must be more advanced. And she was wiser and more advanced, and she was always prophesied that one day she'll take over and be, like, the next iteration. Um, and so, women would look to her and worship of her to rise above their femininity. But it's, it's important to understand that being female wasn't a bad thing, but being human female was. Um, 
but the gods were full. You, you get the idea that the, 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 the Jews were not going to worship these Roman gods. So I'm trying to give you all of this like background of like Greek history. And I'm just sort of assuming that like, you know, something about the, the Bible. And so if you understand that, then like you understand where this is going. Or well, you, 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 you now can't understand where this is going. There were probably people all around the Jewish nation, including the apostles, that prayed every single day for there to be a Messiah. They wanted the oppressive rule of the Romans to end. And so they looked back in the Old Testament and it was prophesied that there would be this Messiah, this coming king, a son of David, and he would defeat evil. And so he's going to defeat the Romans. He would also lead the the Jews out of iniquity. He would, so they were looking for this Messiah and they wanted him to overthrow the Roman government. So think about this. Jesus comes. He is the Messiah. He is God incarnate. They didn't think the Messiah was God incarnate. Um, the Jews called the Messiah a son of God because they, they meant that he was, he was born out of following God. And he was going to follow God better than anyone else. But they didn't mean that he was like, you know, a literal like offspring of God. And uh, Jesus actually called himself son of man more. Which uh, is interesting because what Jesus does is he he gives clues about who he really is, but he never really makes it super clear. In fact, this Son of Man statement doesn't really come to fruition. It's sort of, it's his, apparently, for, for his court, according to the Gospels, it's Jesus' favorite way of describing himself. And you don't really... It doesn't really come to fruition. It, it, it's it's this thing where he's dropping this hint all the time. And it's kind of confusing. And then at the end, at the trial, he references a prophecy from Daniel when they ask him, you know, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And he says, he references this thing and turns it around and makes it clear that, like, I am, and I am God, you know, because of the, the, the specific prophecies that he references from the Old Testament. You will see me sitting at the right hand of the Father on God's throne with him. And so, like, if you go back to that Old Testament passage, it's very clear that it's talking about God. And, it, and what it is is God in that passage is called the Son of Man. And so now it just like it's like a bombshell just like exploded in the middle of everything. So Jesus kind of kept it on the on the down low that like he was the Messiah and that he was God. And part of the reason he did that was because like think about like if he would have just said, "Hey, I'm the Messiah," then they all would have just immediately, you know, jumped on board and said, oh, great, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. Um, and they would have expected him to lead the army to conquer the Romans and, and you know, change the ways. And, and so Jesus was doing all of these miracles and, and bringing all of these teachings with authority. And it was really pumping up the messianic expectations. And so think about this way from Jesus' perspective. The apostles and pretty much everyone in the Jewish nation is praying every day for God to send the Messiah and defeat the Romans. And Jesus had no intention of doing that. But he is the Messiah. He's God incarnate. What was Jesus really going to do? He was going to die for our sins and be raised on the third day. And he, you know, he, so he talks and talks and talks about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. If there's one thing that like sticks out in his teaching, it's this kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, it, this invasion of the earth with God's kingdom. But he makes it clear he's talking about a spiritual invasion. That it's not going to be 
a physical takeover. It's going to be God coming in and taking over human hearts. So, think about, like, not only was Jesus not going to defeat the Romans in battle, he was going, to, the, the Romans in about, well, in A.D. 70, they're going to completely obliterate the Jewish nation and forcibly expel all of the Jews from Israel. And they're not going to return until, like, the 1960s. So, for basically 1,900 years after World War II. So, he's totally not going to do what they want him to do. What the people are probably praying with their honest, most sincere hearts. Think little children, old people. The apostles, everyone is praying every day for Jesus to do this thing. And he's not going to do that at all. And I, I, I've talked a long time about this because I'm trying to help us see the situation. The apostles, you know, like, even after, I think it's after Peter confesses, in one of, maybe it's in Mark, after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and Jesus says, you know, blessed are you for, uh, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father. It's shortly after that, they're like, Jesus starts telling them that, you know, he's going to be betrayed and killed. And, there, and Peter just takes him aside and says, how dare you say that? That never happened to you. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. So that gives you an idea, like, you know, their expectations were totally not what he was going to do. So, I want us to think about that situation with the apostles. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's right around there, uh, the apostles actually ask Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time or at some later time. And they they still, you know, they're still not getting it, basically. So here's the point. Um if you understand that situation, then that's really the key to understanding the point I'm about to try to make. I think in life, we often spend a lot of time wanting God to do things, wondering what God is going to do, being confused, things just aren't making sense, and you and we have some stuff that we know, like, like, uh, the apostles knew that Jesus was sent by God and they need to follow Jesus. And they need to, to follow Jesus' teaching. The apostles knew that the Old Testament was God's word. They knew there's only one God and they worship that one God. But they had these, this expectation of a human, not God incarnate, a human who is such a devoted follower of God that he will lead Israel. He's sent from God and he's going to lead Israel in this basically this takeover of the world. And the Jew, the Jews are going to take over the whole world and get rid of all the evil. And and no oppressive Roman army will be able to stand against him. And it's prophesied in the Old Testament. And they're praying for this every single day. Everyone in the Jewish nation is praying for this. So Jesus comes to these people and says, like, yeah, I'm the Messiah. They would have gotten totally the wrong idea. They were basically looking for someone to, like, free them from slavery. But it was, like, bigger than that. Not just free them from slavery, but, like, free all the slaves in the world. Completely, you know, because the Jews, the Jews thought slavery was a, was a sin. You know, it says in the Old Testament, slavery is a sin. And so... I won't go into you know details if someone wants to argue about that, but it does. 
Um, if you, if someone really wants to argue with me about that, I'd be happy to. But uh, for now, we're just gonna leave that aside. But like, that that that's a that's a point of conflict. <laughs> um, the gods the Romans worshipped and the Greeks, they'd already had a Maccabean revolt, you know. And yet they were reconquered by Romans. So, Jesus had no intention of doing what they wanted him to do, what they expected him to do. It doesn't mean that the apostles didn't know anything about Jesus. They knew some stuff about Jesus. They were right about some stuff. He was the Messiah. He was. They, they were right. He was the Messiah. But he wasn't the Messiah they were looking for. He, you know, basically, you could ask yourself, well, was Jesus keeping secrets about what he really meant to do? Was Jesus keeping secrets? No, because they completely didn't get it. What he was doing was beyond their ability to comprehend. And he was doing everything in his power to show them that. But the main problem, the main obstacle, the main hindrance, the main thing that was slowing that down was all of their expectations. What they decided needed to happen. So they were looking for this to happen. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. And because of all of that, that was the main reason why they weren't receiving what he was, they weren't understanding what he was telling them. You know, like, think about, like, the fact that, like, Jesus gets executed and the disciples scatter. And then when he comes back from the dead, their minds are blown. And something totally, totally different happens. So, like, in other words, when Jesus is crucified, and as far as their expectations go, a bad thing has happened. We thought this guy was the Messiah. He was clearly a prophet. But he's been killed like all the other prophets, killed by corrupt men. So, he's not the Messiah. We thought he was going to be the Messiah. But he was the Messiah. And the fact that he was killed is crucial to what makes him the Messiah. In fact, I think the word crucial comes from the old Latin word for cross. It certainly seems reasonable, doesn't it? But yeah, it was crucial. I won't look it up because... We'll let that be for now. So, it was the crux of the matter. And I know that's what it means. I know that's, uh... I've heard in other words, like, crux means the cross, in, like, in Latin. So, let's look it up. Latin word for cross, right? So, anyway. If you understand all of this then you understand, like, a uh, Latin word for cross. Oh, I was way off. All right, so in Latin, it's tricere. Let's look up crux. Etymology of crux. Okay. It says mid 17th century, so the 1600s, denoting a representation of a cross, chief, chiefly in crux and sada ankh, literally a cross with a handle. From Latin, literally cross. Okay, so maybe the Latin word for cross is not tricere. Let's do this. Let's do Latin to English. We'll see if we can look this up. Uh, 
Maybe maybe had cross as a verb. Yeah, crux is the cross. Okay. So cross, maybe trisier means like uh, to trespass or to like cross a body of water or something like that. But crux means cross. All right, so let's uh, let's do etymology of crucial. Origin is from the Latin crux. All right, the Latin phrase is instantiata, inst you know, instantia crucis, or crucial instance. It comes from cross. So, in in, in Christianity. The cross of Jesus Christ is the crux of the matter. It is crucial to Christianity. If you remove the cross of Jesus Christ, then that's, there's no Christianity in it. So, Jesus was trying to bring them Christianity, and their expectation every day was something other than what he wanted to do. So I think that has a tremendous application for our everyday lives because I think in our everyday lives we constantly are saying wanting something to happen you know wanting a terrible situation to end that's what we're wanting there's a terrible situation and we want it to end and we feel like God's being secretive about when he's going to end it. And that's what they were asking Jesus. When is this going to happen? But what Jesus actually intended to do was something that was beyond their comprehension. Not intellectually, but because of their expectations, because of their attitude, because of their focus, it made it beyond their comprehension. So, It doesn't mean that they didn't know anything. So, in other words, like, even though what God was going to do was something they completely didn't understand, it doesn't mean that he was going to, that they, that they understood nothing. They knew some stuff. They knew that you worship only God. You know, they knew a lot of important things. They knew that you trust Jesus. You know, like, they were on to something with Jesus. They weren't completely wrong about Jesus, but like, what Jesus was actually doing was not what they intended, uh, what, what they in expected at all. Uh, he wasn't going to, uh, you know, have the Israel, I Israel become this political power that takes over the world and, you know, and, and gets evil out of the world. That wasn't what he was going to do at all. Instead, he was going to... do something very different. <laughs> he was going to uh, die for our sins and be raised on the third day and then send the apostles out to the Jews first and then to the Gentile Romans and Greeks and whatever ends Persia, India, China, the barbarians to the north, Ethiopia to the south, everywhere, with the message of Christianity. And the Roman Empire would eventually become Christian, become Christian Empire. And, and then about 100 years after that, it would be destroyed by the barbarians to the north. It was also under attack from the Persians. And then the barbarians to the north would become Christians. And this would be the Middle Ages, the, the first Christian culture in the world, medieval Europe. And then medieval Europe would become so advanced in technology, it would be able to take its cultural beliefs all over the world. Medieval Europe would get rid of slavery have it come back, get rid of it again, but then export its beliefs all over the world. So you think of someone like Mahatma Gandhi who fought back against the racial 
you know, caste system that just oppressed people in India. Well, yeah, but he also went to Oxford. He was a student at Oxford. Carried a New Testament in his back pocket every day. So it's hard to say that, like, the ending of racial oppression in India was without a Western influence. The Western world gave us science. It gave us hospitals and the concept of charity. So, this is the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. God's spiritual kingdom. Now, he didn't necessarily convert all the Romans. You know, there were some people in the Roman Empire who just really hated Christianity and went to their deathbeds and they weren't going to become Christian no matter what. Um, there's one famous emperor named Julian the Apostate. And apostate means that you lost your faith. Although Julian probably didn't really lose his faith. Um, so, like, after, I think, about two Christian emperors, maybe three, you have an emperor who was raised Christian, but as soon as he comes to power, he says, I hate Christianity, and tries to bring paganism back, and persecutes Christians. And so he brings persecution of Christians back after it had presumably been ended, although it hadn't really been ended because as soon as Christianity got political power, it was like different Christians persecuting other Christians. Um, so the kind of tolerance that we think of as the Christian way took a while to take over government. You know, just because so it, it, it took a while for that to form and grow. It's, it's been a long, slow process. But, uh, and it's, it's still a long, slow process. So we still need to, we still need our governments to really follow Christianity. Um, but we're doing better than, you know, we were. So, you get the point. Let's, let's lay it out. Let's summarize. The Jews and even the apostles were praying every day. And all they expected and all they wanted was for Jesus to do something that he had no intention of doing. He was constantly explaining to them what he was actually doing. Which was completely impossible for them to understand. Not because they lacked the intellectual capacity, but because they just... It didn't fit in with their expectations. They had an idea, a model of how the future was going to go. And all they wanted to know was when these things were going to happen. Well, when? 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 They looked at these prophecies from the Old Testament. And they said, okay, when's God going to do that? But they misunderstood. There was a lot in the prophecies that like they left out. And so... I think that has an application for us today. I think that what we need to do is sit back and say, okay, there's some stuff I know that God's shown to me, and I know this, and I know that, and I know, you know, even maybe God's even told you stuff about the future, you know, in whatever way that he wants to do that, you know, but whatever it is, there's stuff that you know, and you know it. But you need to be able to divide out the stuff that you know and separate that out from the things that you don't actually know. Because what happens is we take stuff that we don't know to be true and we decide that it is true and we decide that God's going to do this or God's plan is this or what, what will happen in the future is this. And that becomes an expectation. And so then that becomes a hindrance to us understanding what God is actually doing. Because what he's actually doing might be very different from what we we think he's doing. And so what he's actually doing may be something completely beyond our comprehension. And it might be, you know, that it's not your attitude that's the problem or my attitude that's the problem. It might be that it's just really beyond our comprehension. that we just can't get it, even if we tried. Even if we had a good attitude about it, it's just, I mean, why should everything that God intends to do 
be easy to understand. Shouldn't it be difficult to understand? I mean, this is God we're talking about, right? So, all that being said, it's not that Jesus is being secretive. It's just that we're amazingly, uh, we're putting up amazing roadblocks. We won't listen. We won't pay attention. And if he just comes out, so in other words, this is my point. There are situations where telling the truth is difficult. You know, people oftentimes, they say to you, if you're, if you're trying to explain something difficult to them, they think you're being secretive or you're hiding the truth from them. And the thing is, like, there are situations, like, where it's the truth is difficult to explain. And you're trying to explain it, but if you just come out, if Jesus was just come out and say, yeah, I'm the Messiah then they would have not, he would have not told them the truth. He would have told them a lie because they would have misunderstood what he said, what he meant. And so they have this expectation and what he's going to do is tell them A and then they're going to think B. But what he really wants them to do is think C. You know, so like it just takes that bit of getting people to sit down and, and rethink things. And so for the apostles, you know, they've been with Jesus for a while. And then he dies for their sins and comes back. That was probably a wake-up call for them to completely rethink things. And it was just mind-blowing for them. They're like, huh, what? They had no expectation of that. They had no expectation. I mean, him dying is one thing. They, that seemed to kind of, that kind of made sense to them. But him coming back, it's just like mind-blowing. But see, him dying was how he saved them. How he saved the world from their sins. From its, if he, it's, that's how he defeated evil. Him dying and coming back. That's what he came to do. That's the point. The point of him coming was something that they, they completely had no concept of. And it wasn't that it... It's not as though it wasn't in the Old Testament books that they read and they got their prophecies about the Messiah from. It's that they came to the Old Testament with a certain point of view, with, with expectations, and were looking in there to find things that they were already expecting to find. And so, what Jesus actually did made no sense to them. So he had to, you know, he told them, I mean, they got, they got some right ideas along the way. There were some things they knew that they could be sure of, that they could rely on. You know, they knew that Jesus was the one they trust no matter what. That Jesus is the one they follow no matter what. But, like... What he actually intended to do was not conquer the Romans politically, militarily. He intended to convert them. They didn't expect that at all. He intended to die for the Roman sins and be raised on the third day, completing the punishment. So, like, that's not what they expected him to do at all. They were supposed to die for their sins. He was going to make everyone, you know, he was going to kill people that didn't want to do right. Bring the hammer down. Not let them bring the hammer down on him. That's not what he was supposed to do. And so they couldn't get it. And so if you read the New Testament, you get these guys like, why can't they get it? Why can't they get it? Why can't they get it? Well, it's, it's because they had a completely different expectation. So, I mean, that's that's why I spent so much time talking about Greek mythology and the history and the, the culture and stuff like that because it helps us understand why they had the wrong expectation. Because if we don't, if we don't put ourselves in their context, in their situation, 
and understand what they were dealing with, then we would just never get the right idea because we they would just seem like idiots. And we would fail to realize that, like, we're the idiots. You know, to us, it seems like, you know, God's being secretive. He won't tell me what he's doing. That's probably because you can't understand what he's doing. He probably is telling you what he's doing. And for whatever reason, it may, may seem terrible what's going on in your life. And uh, let's face facts, all of us have to deal with something that is terrible in our life, you know, like, but for some people it's just like, it seems like it must be far, far worse for some people. And uh, my point is this. As terrible as it all is, what God's actually doing might be completely different. So, in other words, a situation is only bad when it does not fulfill its objective. So, in other words, like, you cannot say that something is bad until you know like what the point is what the goal is so like I don't know I'm, I'm, there's no point in giving examples other than you know the biblical one like they were real sure that Jesus dying would be bad because their objective for Jesus was to become a military conquering hero to kill the bad people and and then and then usher in a new kingdom a Jewish kingdom that would take over the world and lead people into righteousness. And if anyone opposed him, they, they would be destroyed physically, killed, defeated. And and this would the fact that like no one could stop him, that would that would change the world. No one can stop the Messiah. He's gonna kill everyone who does who who does bad. And that would straighten things out, wouldn't it? And uh so if that's the case, then the evil people killing him would be bad. But if he's coming to die for their sins, then it, then it's good that Jesus is dead. Like the crucifixion of Jesus is a good thing. I mean, if Christianity is a good thing, then the crucifixion is crucial to Christianity. It's the crux of the matter. So, from Jesus' perspective, uh, what he was doing made perfect sense. Is You know, when Peter says that, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be executed by the Romans... Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan. For you, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. He considers that satanic. From Jesus' perspective, the Messiah that they were looking for was satanic. That was a satanic idea. Now, it's important enough for us to understand that not everything the apostles thought was wrong. They thought Jesus was a prophet sent by God, and that when he spoke, that was what God said. They were absolutely right about that. They, they you know, thought that Jesus was the person who's their Lord, and their master, and their teacher. And Jesus, Jesus said in John 15, you know, you, you guys call me Lord and teacher, and master, and he says, you know, so I am. He says, you're right for calling me that because I am. You know, and they continue to call him Christ the Lord. And typically in the New Testament, when they say the Lord, they mean Jesus. So, and he was the Lord, and they were right about that. But they were more right about that than they thought. Because they had no concept that, like, he's going to defeat evil in every way the evil of the human heart and that he's he is God 
They didn't get that. They didn't get that. I think it was after uh, the thing where Peter calls him the Messiah and then he's getting thee behind me, Satan. I think after that comes the transfiguration. And they still don't get it. You know, you think like, okay, the transfiguration, and here's Jesus transfigured before them, shining in this amazing way, and he's here with Moses and Elijah. And it appears that Peter just wanted to stay there because he thought it was so great to be there. But then Moses and Elijah disappear and Jesus is transfigured back to who he was. And you think, oh, that's so sad. You know, what? So how cool they were there with Moses and Elijah come down from heaven. And it's like, yeah, but that pales in comparison to who Jesus is. It's nothing. You know, Moses and Elijah were lucky to be there talking to Jesus. And to think that, like, Jesus died for your sins and is raised to new life, you know, completing all of the punishment, and he will now die no more. And that this will now apply to you, and you can have his life, eternal life, the Holy Spirit, inside you. Moses and Elijah should be jealous. They, they ought to be jealous. So, like, this is an important point. We don't allow God to be God. And we have in mind the things of man instead of the things of God. you got to let God be God and let God do what God wants to do. Because God's going to do what God wants to do. And if you don't like it, well, too bad for you. That's what's going to happen. Okay? So, your life will be a lot easier... Once you get on track with the what's actually going on. Once you get on the reality train. Because what God says is going to happen is the reality train. And what God says is going to happen is not necessarily something that you expect him to do. And if it seems like he's being secretive, it's probably because what he's going to do is not what you have any expectation of. Or, can, or perhaps can even possibly comprehend, even if you were trying to expect it. You know, maybe you can't expect it because you can't conceive of it. Because it's beyond your your intellectual capacity or mind or any humans. So, I'll just say it one more time and then I guess we can go. I guess we beat this to the ground. In life, like the apostles, there are some things you know. This person, you know, like... You know what love is. You know it's a good thing. You know that when God, what God said he's going to do, he's going to do. But any other expectations that like you thought this was going to happen, and you, you thought that was going to happen, and that's the way life's supposed to be, and this is the way life's supposed to be, says who? Maybe what God is doing is beyond your comprehension. And maybe part of the reason what God wants to do is beyond your comprehension is because you're spending too much time expecting something else that you know maybe was how he worked in someone else's life or some other situation but what he's trying to do with you might be completely beyond all of that he might be taking things to another level because that's what he did with the apostles. I mean, if you look at the, at the at the Jewish nation and they were ruled by the Hellenist Greeks, and you have the Maccabean Revolt, and then it's a successful revolt and it's a revolt against the the Greek laws that they had to worship Greek gods. And they're like, no, we're not going to do that. Miracles are done, and a kingdom is set up, the Hasmonean Dynasty, and you actually have independent Jews who were able to follow their, their God, but then they're conquered by the Romans. And so, then along comes Jesus, the Messiah, and they're expecting Jesus to like redo the same model that he did with the Maccabees. Except, this time, you know, it'll be more awesome. Let's do more of that. And he's like, Jesus is like, no, we're going to do none of that. We're going to completely rethink things and completely just do a, a, a 180 on all of that and like 
we're going we're going in a totally different direction and it's going to be it's going to make that seem pointless compared to what we're doing I mean, it, what you expect is not just not what God's doing, but from God's perspective, it's the dumbest thing ever. It's completely pointless and stupid. You know, it's like it's like uh, you're wearing diapers, and you think that like the goal is to get better diapers so you can like poop in your pants more comfortably, and God's trying to potty train you. It's like, oh yeah, this is way better. You know, at the very least, you can poop in the woods or something, and like, instead of going in your pants, you can just like take your pants off right quick, and just kind of squat, take a squat real quick, wipe off, and then like pull your pants back on, and there's no poopy in your pants. But you know, we have this expectation of like pooping your pants is what you do. It's all I've ever known, and. <laughs> I need better diapers. I need to make pooping in my pants more comfortable. And it's like, God has this idea like, instead of doing that, let's just not, not poop in our pants. You know, like, let's get the poop outside of the pants. Just, you know, if it wasn't in my pants, that would be better. <laughs> so like, maybe that's what God's doing. You're wanting, instead of wanting to be potty trained, you know, you're wanting to keep the poop in your pants. <laughs> uh, and maybe what he wants to do is, te you know, teach you how to go in the potty. Or at least go on the floor or something that's better than just keeping it in your pants where it's going to squish out slowly. No, let's not do that. So anyway, there you have it. Hope this video made some sense. Thank you for your time.